All right, so last time um, I explained uh, what kind of transfers these cohomology theories um, induced by motivic spectra have. Uh, yeah, so this was this, um, well, this was basically the final answer right here. And um, so this serves as motivation for the next thing, which uh, is the infinity category of frame correspondences. So I wanna start with uh, defining this. Um, And um, so we're gonna be interested in those, now looking at this general transfers that uh, from last time, we're interested now in those that don't actually shift the degree. Those that actually induce some covariant functionality on the, on the, the kind of unshifted homology theory. And so you see for this, we need the virtual tangent bundle T of F in this formula to be uh, zero, yeah? So this is what this definition uh, is saying. So suppose you have a LCI morphism. X to S, um, then um, if uh, we're gonna say a framing of this, um, but the more precise thing to say would be a stable zero dimensional framing of F. Uh, this is, it is a trivialization of this virtual tangent bundle. Um, so it's, uh, so it's a path in the K-theory space of X um, between the, this virtual tangent bundle and zero. Um, Right, so you see if you have, so if in addition F is proper, if you have a proper SEI morphism, which is framed, then you will have um, an, a transfer in cohomology that does not shift uh, the degree at all. Um, and then, so this is a definition in quotation marks because I'm not really going to define precisely uh, the infinity category of frame correspondences, but I will describe it informally. So core framed uh, of smooth S schemes. So this is an infinity category um, with the following features. Um, so it's objects are uh, the smooth S schemes. Mm. And the morphisms. Uh, so they are going to be uh, spans over S. So the morphism from X to Y is going to be a span like this, X, Z, Y where uh, this morphism here, so let's call this one F. Uh, so F is finite local complete intersection. Um, and um, it is framed in the sense of the previous definition. So that means um, there exists some uh, there is given, sorry, uh, there is given some path from TF to zero in the K3 space of Z. Uh, right, and this alpha is, is part of the, the datum of the morphism. Yeah, so, so a morphism is really um, such a span together with this alpha here. Um, and then the composition works as it uh, usually does for um, correspondences. So, uh, yeah, so if you have two spans like this, um, so what you want to do is form the pullback here. Um, and then you also have to now define an induced uh, framing for the composite here. Uh, so, and let me give some names to these maps, F, G, H. Um, so if you look at the virtual tangent bundle of the composition, uh, F 
sorry, uh, is first H, yeah, so I guess like this. So the virtual tangent bundle for composition um, is the sum of the virtual tangent bundle of H and the pullback of the virtual tangent bundle of F. Uh, so this is the sum which is happening in the K theory uh, in the K theory space of the pullback here, and um, and this is canonical. So this comes from so one way to see this is uh, from the canonical cofiber sequence that you have on cotangent complexes. So remember that this virtual tangent bundle in the K theory space um, is induced by the cotangent complex of F, you know, which is a perfect complex and induce, induces. Uh, this K theory elements. Um, right, so we have this, and then the tangent bundle of H is the pullback of that of G. So I also need to name this map here. Uh, actually, this one. Let's call it B. So this T of H is a sort of pullback by B of uh, T of G. Right, so if both F and G are framed, uh, if both F and G are framed, then, then this one is zero and this one is also zero. And so you get an induced framing for the composite, right? So, yeah, so, so the framings uh, compose. If you compose two Fourier morphisms, there's a canonical induced frame. Um, okay, so that's how composition works. Um, ah, and one remark here. Um, is that these conditions on the morphism F that is finite LCI and framed actually implies that it's flat. Um, this is relevant because um, in general, LCI morphisms are not stable on the base change. So, uh, but if they, they are, if they are flat. Yeah. I mean, they are, they are stable on the tor independent base change in general. So if they're um, LCI and flat, uh, also called syntomic, then they're stable on the base change. So this is why this H is again a local complete intersection when you form this pullback. Um, okay, so this gives you a, uh, well an idea of what this infinity category is. Um, uh, but of course, it's uh, it's a fair amount of work to actually construct to construct this infinity category um, rigorously. Uh, I've got a quick question. Um, yeah. Why is there not a unique map from TF to zero? Like unique up to coherent homotopy? Isn't that uh, the terminal map or no? Well, I mean, KZ is an infinity group point, so there's no. Oh, okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. Oh, and I, I guess one other question. So in general, uh, there could no, not exist a map. I mean, TF doesn't have to be trivial. Hmm. But, and if it is trivial, then the space of possible alphas is going to be a torso under the loop, the loop space of K theory. All right, thanks. So there's no. Um, right, so uh, I want you to make a comment or so on this uh, finiteness condition here. Um, of course, we want, so I mean, we want to construct a category such that any motivic spectrum, if you look at the cohomology theory represented by a motivic spectrum, it's going to be a contravariant functor on this category. Yeah? So you can pull back here and push forward here. So you need to have transfers along these maps. And we know that we would have such transfer. So in order to have such transfer, I could replace the word finite by proper here. That would be enough. Yeah? Because we know that for these proper LCI things, we have these transfers. Um, and uh, right, so I mean, you, you could do this. I, I mean, you would get a kind of larger, larger infinity category with more morphisms if you relax this finiteness condition here. Um, so, I mean, one kind of technical issue is now you have, you're forced to look at derived schemes because right now, if you, if you don't have the finiteness here, then you don't have this flatness either. And so then you're forced, then you're forced to take derived pullbacks in the composition. 
Um, but okay, this is not really an issue. I mean, you just do the same thing where you allow this Z to be a derived scheme. That's no problem. Uh, but really, the reason we need finiteness here is um, so there is a crucial technical reason that requires us to take uh, only finite maps here, and is that we want these transfers to be compatible with the Nisnevich topology. So if you have, and what I mean by compatible is if you have if you have a pre-sheaf with frame transfers, by which I would mean a pre-sheaf on this category of framed uh, correspondences. And if I just forget that it has this frame transfer and I can Nisnevichify it, um, then it will have a canonically induced uh, structure of frame transfers. So Nisnevichification will inherit frame transfers. And, um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, this is not difficult to see and it boils down to the fact that if you have a Henselian local scheme, you have a scheme which is finite over a Henselian local scheme, then it's a disjoint union of Henselian local schemes. This is why some of this Nisnevich uh, topology, uh, also the et al topology, they play well with the uh, finite morphisms. So this would not work with the Zariski topology, for example. Um, well, yeah, so this is, this is a crucial technical feature that we need for these species with frame transfers, yeah, which is why we, we need this word finite. And I mean, as a, as a side effect, we don't have to consider derived schemes, I guess. Um, OK. Um, so another remark. Oops. Um, I'll show you a couple. So this uh, category core frames, um, it's uh, semi-additive. So that means that uh, finite sums and finite products coincide in this category. And uh, we kind of, so you have kind of a direct sum operation, which is given by um, well, it's given by the disjoint union of, of the schemes. The disjoint union of the scheme is both the, the co-product and the product in this category, and it also has a symmetric monoidal structure, um, which is given by um, the Cartesian products of schemes. Um, and also, um, one can construct, say, canonical functors um, So you could look at the category of finite et al correspondences. Right, so this is a much simpler category. This is just a two category now. Where this uh, spans where the left um, the left map is finite et al, and there's a canonical uh, functor from these two chord frames. And this is because if f is finite et al, then uh, there is a canonical alpha for if f is finite et al. Uh, because the cotangent complex of f is then actually zero. Yeah. So it's canonical trivialization. And this um, induces this functor. And also, what you can do is you can forget the framing. So if you have such a finite um, LCI transfer, and you forget the framing, then you just get um, a, a finite symptomic correspondence. So that means um, flat and LCI. Um, Right, and then, I mean, you could go further to other c categories of correspondences from there, for example, um, this, this, uh, there's a further functor to Vojvodsky's category correspondences. Um, I guess maybe it's just, you know, like this, uh, Vojvodsky. Okay, so now some notation. Um, right, so first of all, let me introduce some notation for motivic homotopy theory I haven't introduced yet. So I will just write HS for the motivic homotopy category over S. So this is um, uh, infinity category of a one invariant 
Is that achieves? On smoother desk schemes. Um, and SH of S, so is the P1 stable uh, category, so uh, TV spectra over S, yeah, so this already used. Um, and let me remind you that this is um, the objects in there are sequences. Uh, of pointed motivic spaces uh, with the uh, equivalences. So the high space is the, um, the P1 or T loop space. So the next one. Right, and now we can do the same where instead of the category smooth schemes, we use this category of frame correspondences. And so this uh, gives a category of frame to motivic spaces. Um, so this is A1 invariant, this net achieves with framed transfers. Uh, so this is a full subcategory of uh, just three sheaves on this infinity category of frame correspondences. Um, and then uh, we can also P1 stabilize this. So this is um, T spectra. In this category. All right, so it's so, uh, exactly the same as this uh, sequence, sequences like this with these equivalences. Um, and there's of course a comparison between these uh, non-framed and framed categories. So there's a functor of a graph, graph type functor from the category of smooth schemes to this category of framed correspondences. Uh, right, I mean, this is kind of the identity on objects. I mean, on morphisms, you just, I mean, it just hits those spans where the morphism F is the identity with the canonical framing. Yeah. Mark, sorry, can I have a question? A quick question. Yeah. Uh, I'm a client of uh, What is T more precisely? What, what do you take by the model of T capital, T spectra? Uh, T, yeah. So T, I mean, I mean, um, A1 modulo A1 minus zero. Yeah, so I mean, of yeah, course, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, uh, it is not a shift. You, you can uh, consider it as a pre-shift. Yeah, but uh, because I mean, this T only appears in this omega T, so it doesn't matter if it's a pre sheaf or not. Uh, because I mean, this uh, this E i plus one is going to be uh, local. Yeah? So any, so I am I'm, I'm taking the home from T into this thing. So it doesn't matter if I consider T as a as a sheaf or not. But yeah, I mean, or yeah, I don't know is that. Uh, no, we could take, I, T, I, I, take T yeah. to be the motivic localization of this uh, gadget as well. That would not make yeah. a difference. Yeah. Um. Well, yeah, and I guess, okay, I guess it makes sense of this but, here in this but, context. Uh, sorry, uh, I mean, uh, your quotients, you take your quotients in the category of pre shapes. Uh, yeah. So not in the I mean, it, it, makes no, it makes no difference in which category actually. But uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess officially, yes, T is just this pre shape portion. Yeah, yeah, in fact. yeah, officially, because it's a big difference between pre-shift quotients and shift quotients. Yeah. This is what uh, was my question. So, thank you. Um, yeah, so officially it should be the it should be the pre-shift quotient. In fact, later on the, the difference will pay roll. So I mean, it doesn't pay roll right here, but it will pay roll later. Um, 
So, right, so we have this uh, graph functor and this induces, um, and the usual way we induce functors uh, from um, motivic spaces to frame the motivic spaces. Uh, so this kind of left-hand extension of this functor here, uh, and then it has right adjoint, which is just uh, forget the, the transfers. Um, and then also SH, SH frames. Similarly, you have an adjunction here with the forgetful functor here. This is like three, uh, three frames transfers functor. And um, here you have the suspension spectrum this one base point, I suppose, and the right adjoint, and here also, and here these functors are reinforced when it can be framed, and it seems to be framed. Um, right, so you have this, this square, and I mean all the, I mean the square of left adjoint uh, commutes, and the square of right adjoint commutes as well. Uh. Okay, so now, uh, so this is now the main uh, theorem, is the recognition principle, motivic spectra. Uh, so again, so I mean, the, in this form is due to uh, Elemento, myself, Khan, Sostnilo, Jakerson, and, and Ananievsky, Karakushka, Nishitov, Anin. Um, okay, so I'm gonna just put basically everything in this one theorem. Yeah, so it's gonna be several parts. Um, it's the first part. Uh, right, so this is sometimes called the reconstruction theorem. And it says that um, for every scheme S, So this canonical functor is an equivalence. So, um, I mean, one way to read this is that every motivic spectrum has a unique structure of, of a frame transfers, has unique frame transfers. Um, this is what this is saying and Two, uh, two, this is the, oops, cancellation theorem. And this is our perfect field K. Um, and the functors, so this uh, S1 suspension functor and the GM suspension factor um, reviewed as endor functors of this category. Um, and in fact, I did say so forgot to introduce one piece of notation. Well, let me write it here and I explain what that means. So these two functors are fully faithful. So this GP subscript uh, means uh, is a full subcategory of uh, group-like objects. Yeah. So this category, right, because this category of frame correspondence is in semi-additive, uh, if you look at pre-sheaves on this, which preserves finite products, they are automatically valued in the uh, infinity spaces. Um, and in particular, this, this category here is semi-additive, this category of frame and metric spaces. So that means every object in this category has a unique structure of a commutative monoid. And I look at the full subcategory uh, on the groups, on the, these objects uh, that are groups. Um, yeah, so these two functors are pretty faithful. So uh, the, the statement for GM is like the uh, usual, like the Vodsky style cancellation theorem. Uh, 
statement about S1, I mean, one way to understand it is it's saying that this infinity category is actually a pre-stable infinity category, if you're familiar with this terminology. So it's, it sits fully faithfully in its, um, in its uh, stabilization. Um, and three, uh, so this is a strict A1 invariance here. Yeah. Uh, again, K is a perfect field. So he's saying that if you have some uh, pre sheaf with frame transfers, uh, which is a, which is a group like as before. So this yeah, so this sigma here um, means those pre sheaves that preserve finite products. Uh, which uh, so this ensures so the objects in this category are all uh, commutative monads. I look at again at the group like ones. Um, then so if I a one localize and the risky should be five this uh, this belongs to this category of frames. Uh, well, maybe I, yeah. I may mean, be a bit more verbose, yeah. So it's an A1 invariant instant sheet. Right, so this LA1 here, this means, so this is the usual, um, a1 localization uh, functor, so it's, um, its value on some scheme u is given by the geometric realization of this simplicial space. Uh, and of course, uh, yeah, and this one is just a specification. Uh, right, so I mean, I said actually earlier that the risky certification was not um, compatible with frame transfers, but uh, I mean, this part of the statement is that you see the risky certification actually is already the Nisnevi certification. So this, um, yeah, so I mean, this, this does make, so this, this uh, is again, appreciate with transfers. Um, and um, it's so, so this is a motivic space with frame transfer. It's an object in H frame. Okay. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah, so this part three is really, um, and this is really important part from a, you know, a, perspective because I mean it tells you that in general if you have some pre sheaves on, on smooth schemes and you're trying to uh, compute this motivic localization is very complicated I and mean, you don't really know how to do it so by motivic localization I mean just a localization in this category of a1 invariant instant H sheaves yeah? um, but when this pre sheaf has some additional structure like frame transfers then um, you have this kind of formula to compute it and I mean, this is still complicated, but at least it's, it's concrete and explicit. Yeah? So for example, because this is only the risky certification, if you're only interested in the global sections of the species, for example, and evaluate it on, on, on fields, then um, this does not play a role, yeah? This doesn't change the value on fields. So you just have this geometricalization of this simplicial space, yeah? which is, I mean, complicated thing, but you know, you have like, for example, you can compute then the, the homotopy groups of this using uh, Bowsfield clown type spectral sequence. Yeah, since the geometric realization is simplicial space. Um, yeah, so this is, uh, of course, the generalization of theorem of Wybotsky, which asserted this with the, the um, stronger notion of uh, the transfers in the sense of Wybotsky. So it's a generalization of that result.
Uh, okay, so I mean, so these are the three kind of main uh, uh, foundational theorems about uh, train correspondences, I guess. And we uh, mentioned a corollary which puts some of these together. So the corollary is that so when k is a perfect field. Uh, so this is a corollary of one and two. So when k is a perfect field, uh, this category of frames, so we have an equivalence between the category of these group-like framed motivic spaces and the category of motivic spectra, which are very effective. And very effective means this is a full subcategory um, generated on the co-limits by suspension spectra. Uh, right, so this immediate, this follows immediately from this theorem. I mean, this cancellation theorem implies, in particular, that the infinite suspension functors are fully faithful. Um, and then, so the, um, and then, so you have the infinite frame suspension functor from here to here, which is fully faithful, and then this equivalent. So then you just have to identify the image of this fully faithful embedding, and then it's more or less clear that this is exactly the image. Um, so this corollary is the analog of this, uh, this theorem that I stated in the context of manifolds. Mm, yeah, this is the analog of this theorem. Yeah. The equivalence between connective spectra and these group-like uh, cohomology fields with uh, finite et transfers. All right. Um, so I will make some comments on the on the proof of this, uh, but I want to uh, give some examples first. I can I explain a, um, a recipe maybe that um, this this theorem gives you? So if you have, if you start with some pre sheaf with frame transfers. Um, then, I mean, this, this sigma infinity frame functor, you should think of it as a, as a machine for producing motivic spectra. You start with any pre sheaf with frame transfer, you can apply sigma infinity frame to it. And you get, well, you get a frame motivic spectrum, but this is the same by this reconstruction theorem, it's just the same as an ordinary motivic spectrum. Um, so this allows you to build motivic spectra from uh, frame pre sheaves. Uh, I guess that's the main yeah. that's that's the main use of this reconstruction theorem here. Yeah. And um, now, in addition, in the case when S is a perfect field, so um, then the um, parts two and three of this theorem, or, or maybe just the corollary here. Um, well, now part, part two and three of the theorem, I basically uh, compute for you the infinite loop space of this uh, motivic spectrum. Uh, so loops infinity frames of F. Um, Obtain so you first have to so if your f was not group complete you have to group complete it first so that you can apply this part two and three so part two and three only apply to uh, to group like objects um, and then you just have to make it a one invariant and um, zariski localize and then this computes the infinite loop space of the spectrum. Um, Okay, so this is kind of a general recipe. 
And now I want to give you a, a long list of uh, that on perhaps, but a list of examples um, of this uh, in action. Examples. Um, all right, so let me start with a list of spectra, matrix spectra that uh, we know and love, starting with the sphere spectrum called one. Um, then I put some cobordism spectra, MSL, MDL. Um, we have the connective uh, Hermitian KTV spectrum and algebraic KTV spectrum. Um, right, and then we have the Milnovitz material cohomology spectrum and the ordinary material cohomology spectrum. Okay, so these are some well-known uh, matrix spectra, um, which we like. They're all infinity rings, in fact, and all these uh, all these morphisms are infinity ring maps. Uh, yeah, so now um, I, I will tell you that each of these spectrum is in fact sigma infinity frames of something. Um, right, so starting with the sphere spectrum. Okay, so the sphere spectrum, this is uh, not a particularly inter interesting one. It's just the unit uh, for the symmetric monoidal structure in motivic spectra. So of course, the sigma infinity frame functor is a symmetric monoidal functor, so it could be the image of the unit uh, for the symmetric monoidal structure on frame three sheets. And that is, um, this is just a frame three sheaf which is represented by the final object. And so this we denote by F sin frames. So this is a three sheaf that sends uh, X to uh, the uh, infinity groupoids of framed uh, finite um, symptomic, as equivalent to SCI here. Um, X. Schemes. So in other words, this is the stack of framed finite symptomic schemes. Uh, and so see if we take, and that's the unit object uh, in this category here. And so sigma infinity frame gives you the sphere spectrum. So this in itself is not a very interesting statement, but I mean, what maybe is more interesting is that if you have a perfect field, then um, this can give you some sort of formula for the underlying space of the sphere spectrum. Namely, you start with this thing, this stack, and you have to group complete the stack and then localize like this, and this gives you the underlying space of the sphere. Um, right, and then so there's some variants of this, so you can look at the stack of uh, finite tonic morphisms. Uh, with an orientation, and by orientation here I mean um, a trivialization of the canonical bundle. So the canonical bundle, which is also the determinant of the of the virtual tangent bundle, so it's a line bundle. Um, so yeah, this is what I mean by orientation in this context: trivialization of the canonical bundle. Um, and right, whereas by contrast, the framing is a trivialization of the actual virtual tension bundle. So of course, if you have a framing, then you have an induced orientation because the canonical bundle is a determinant of the tension bundle. Um, and then you can also completely forget this additional structure and just look at the stack of finite symptomic schemes. Um, right, and these two, if you take sigma infinity frame of these, you get MSL and MGL respectively. Uh, so this is something that I will talk more about uh, next time on Monday. Um, this business with the algebraic cobordism spectra. Um, right, and what about this KQ spectra here? So this is so there's some interesting things to say here. Um, so 
So here you can uh, forget from finite symptomic to finite flat. So you can look at the stack of finite flat schemes. Um, and you can also look, right, and you can forget further to the stack of vector bundles. Right, so if you have a finite flat scheme, a structure sheaf is a, a structure sheaf is a vector bundle, it's finite locally free. So you have these uh, morphisms of stacks. And uh, on that side, um, you have, so the analog here is, well, I mean, a finite flat morphism cannot be, doesn't make sense to orient a finite flat morphism in general because, um, well, I mean, the canonical bundle is not, well, okay, it does make sense, I guess it does make sense, <laughs> but, uh, but if it is oriented, then that means in particular that the canonical bundle is the line bundle, so it's a Gorenstein morphism. So I guess we write this as F core instead of F flat. Um, so these are, this is a stack of finite Gorenstein morphisms which are oriented in the same sense as for finite symptomic morphisms. Um, and these uh, forget to vector bundles with uh, non-degenerate symmetric value form. Um, right, so I feel I need some horizontal dividers in this picture than drawing here. Okay, maybe, I mean, so it turns out that both of these, if you take sigma infinity frame, you get this spectra here. So uh, if you take sigma infinity frame of finite flat, you get this KGL, and also sigma infinity frame of back to get this KGL. Um, and similarly, these two, these two stack give you this material spectrum. Um, right, and then these last two here, um, well, what you can do is you can, um, yeah, there's various ways uh, to write this. Uh, now you can pass the isomorphism classes in these stacks. So these are all uh, stacks of groupoids. And you can just pass to isomorphism classes. Yeah, maybe let me write this explicitly. Yeah, and these, uh, of course, these, I mean, as, as a sheaf, this is just a sheaf of natural numbers. Yeah. Uh, so, so this maps further to the constant sheaf Z. And um, here you could put the, for example, the unramified Gretton would be chief here with the forgetful map. Yeah, so I mean, there's various things you could put here, but um, these, uh, so these are all some pre with frame transfers, such that if you apply sigma anti frames to it, you get these two motivic spectra here. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, this picture didn't <laughs> come out as nice as I hoped it would be, but uh, yeah, this. Hopefully it's clear what I mean by, by this, yeah. So, are there any questions on this, uh, these examples? Uh, right, so I should say that here, um, can you say a little bit more about these Gorenstein uh, schemes? Uh, yeah, I can, I can do that. And uh, if you allow me a second before this, I'm gonna give some uh, references here. So this, the fact that these vertical morphisms, so in fact, these vertical morphisms are um, a one equivalence after group completion. So this is why in particular, they, they have the same frame matrix. And so this is joint work, um, with uh, Joachim Vialisfer, Dennis Nadine, um, Bert Tataro, and uh, Maria Jacobson. Um, uh, Gorenstein, yeah, so Gorenstein, this means that um, they are those, I mean, 
yeah, so if you want to define flat morphisms um, such that the canonical, such, such that the dualizing sheaf is, uh, is a line bundle, yeah. So, so you can always define the dualizing sheaf. Um, well, so they have, so, okay, if, if the cotangent complex is perfect, then you have a dualizing sheaf, which is determinant of a cotangent complex. So, again, you can define the dualizing sheaf more generally. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm confusing myself. Yeah, Gorenstein just means that the dualizing sheaf is a line bundle. Um, and oriented, so uh, uh, oriented Gorenstein morphism, so orientation is an additional structure on such a finite Gorenstein scheme, which is a trivialization of the canonical sheet. I mean, this is oriented means the same as this oriented up here. Um, and this orientation, now if we just look at the structure sheet of a finite Gorenstein scheme, um, which is it's in, it's in particular finite flat, so it's a vector bundle, and this orientation now induces a non-degenerate symmetric linear form on that bundle. Um, by a Grotten dig duality. So that's why you have a, this vertical forgetful one. Um, okay. Yeah, so in this example, I didn't specify what the base scheme was. Um, for some of these, the base scheme can be arbitrary, for example, for the sphere spectrum and these algebraic cobordism spectra, and also for the motivic homology spectrum. If you take uh, Spitzbeck's definition of this uh, motivic spectrum over a general base, then it's always the frame suspension spectrum of uh, the constant sheaf Z. Uh, and yeah, these true these uh, computations here are also valid over any base. Um, these ones not, yeah. But this they basically because this uh, effective cover of these. Uh, so these are by definition these are the very effective cover of the, the spectra BKO and BKDL, and these are not. Uh, I mean, effective covers. Um, well, not particularly well behaved over general base. Yeah? So that's why these results are restricted to fields. I mean, if you knew that. Uh, these motivic spectra were stable on the base change, for example, then you would use also the statement of a general base. Um, what is true of a general base, however, is if you start with this free sheet with frame transfers and take the frame suspension spectrum, so then you have a bot element there, and if you invert the bot element, we will get the, the big version of this spectra. Um, and this will be true then over any base at least here if two is invertible and then um, okay so now let me make some comments um, on the proof of the main theorem Uh, okay, let's scroll back up to, to this, yeah. Um, okay, so I'm not going to say much about the proof of two and three. And what I will say is that, um, roughly speaking, two and three are just analogs of um, Wojewodzki's results about, uh, Wojewodzki's results about uh, his, his finite correspondences. So two and three, the game is just to, you know, generalize these techniques of Wojewodzki. Um, same arguments, same types of arguments as for uh, Vygotsky's finite correspondences. Um, uh, let me give you a, so there's a nice reference for a cancellation theorem. Um, you, um, so Tom Bachman has 
uh, a preprint uh, earlier this year where it proves the cancellation theorem for finite flat correspondences. And uh, particularly in this paper, he has, I mean, he has some axiomatic setup for a, a proof of cancellation theorem, uh, which is quite nice. And it applies in particular to this, these frame correspondences as well. Um, so it's a paper, uh, yeah, I don't remember the exact title at the moment, but it starts with cancellation theorem, so it should be easy to find. Uh, cancellation, cancellation theorem for uh, finite flat correspondences or something like this. Um, but somehow uh, what's, what's uh, completely new in this theory of frame correspondences is, is part one of this theorem. Yeah, so part one of this theorem is of course, uh, well, of course it's not true for Vervotsky's correspondences because for Vervotsky's correspondences, this gives the category DM. So this is um, so this is where somehow most of the new uh, the new IDs are, so to speak. And um, and the first key ID is uh, computation of Vygotsky. Uh, so I'm just gonna yeah, I'm gonna give a very rough outline of the proof I see here starting with the so-called Vygotsky lemma. Uh, so Vygotsky's lemma is a computation of the Nisnevich chief associated with the quotient of a scheme by an open subscheme. Um, so it's a very general computation. So if you have X a scheme and U open subscheme, Um, so if you just take the quotient x mod u as a, as a free sheaf on schemes, um, and this may be chiefify it, then, uh, so this is this may be chief, and its value on some scheme y is given explicitly as follows. So it's the set of pairs, c comma phi, where uh, Z is a closed subset of Y, and um, this phi is uh, a morphism from the initialization of Y at Z to X such that uh, the preimage of U, uh, sorry, the preimage of the complement of U is precisely Z. Uh, and what do I mean by hensalization here? So um, it's not very precise. I mean, if uh, if y is a fine, I actually mean the hensalization. Otherwise, really, what I mean is I mean the pro-system of etal neighborhoods of z inside y. Yeah, so I mean, really, what this means is that uh, there is a morphism phi from some etal neighborhood of z in y to x. But these Italian neighborhoods are only considered up to refinements. Um, okay, so I mean, what's the point of this lemma? Well, this lemma allows you to describe explicitly um, the following um, mapping space, which is. Uh, Uh, yeah, so suppose you have two smooth S schemes, yeah. Mm. AN modulo AN minus zero smash Y plus. Uh, oh, sorry, and I forgot the Nisnevich unification, which is crucial here. I want to compute 
uh, the morphisms of pointed Nisnevichi. So, so Nisnevichi is probably the target here. Um, right, so I mean, what's the relevance of this? Well, another way to write this, uh, so this is some, some set, and another way to write it is as uh, loops n1 of the Nisnevich unification of uh, the n folds t suspension of y plus evaluated on x. Right, so you know that there's no there's no a one invariance going on here, so I have to be careful to distinguish between this t and this v one. I mean, these are the, 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 these become the same after you know Nisnevich a one localization, but just as Nisnevich chiefs, they are different. And so I indicate this in the notation this way. Um, So you can apply this lemma to compute this. Yeah, why? Because this thing here, well, this is precisely of this form. This is a quotient of your fine space over Y by the complement of the zero section. So it's a quotient of this form, which we need to actually and then we are mapping this thing. This is also the quotient of, two, uh, of something by something else. And so we can um, compute this and you, so from Vyvodsky's lemma, you get the following answer. So this is given by, uh, you have a span like this, x, z, y, for this map f, um, where z is a closed uh, subset of t1 to the n. Uh, over x, sorry. Closed. Um, and also z is disjoint from the boundary of this p1 to the uh, n. So in other words, um, yeah, because this, this match product here is p1 to the n modulo this boundary. Right. Uh, so you have a z close there, and then you have this phi, which um, goes from um, an Italian neighborhood of z in, in there to y, uh, sorry, to a n over y, such that uh, the preimage of zero is z. I forgot to write uh, this intersection as to the NT. Right, so this data is precisely describes this uh, set of pointed maps of this NH. And uh, you know that because of this condition, so uh, this means that the Z actually uh, sits inside AN, inside of there. And because it's closed in, in, P, in P1 to the N, it's, it's actually a finite morphism. So z to x is finite, and then um, this condition, I mean, this phi here uh, gives you a framing on f as well, because um, um, right, so I mean, this equation tells you that the z is cut out by, um, is cut out by n equations, but it's finite over x and embedded in p1 to the n. So it's co-dimension exactly n cut out by n equation. So it's actually a local complete intersection. And then um, it is framed because uh, in fact, the normal bundle of this closed embedding here is going to be the pullback of, because of this, is going to be the pullback of the normal bundle of, of zero in a, which is of course uh, trivial. So this gives the trivialization of this normal bundle. Uh, so the conclusion is that uh, you get this forgetful functor to core frames from x to y. Um, okay, so uh, maybe I can conclude with uh, the following theorem. 
um, which is about this forgetful map here. So the forgetful map from loops n p one is now a GP patient sigma n t y to call framed blank into y. So this is just a map from above. And um, this is uh, motivic equivalence um, if y is here. So y is a smooth S scheme. This forgetful map is a motivic equivalence. Yeah, okay, so I don't think I, I can say any more about how the proof of ACM goes, but I mean, this gives you an idea uh, as to how um, these frame correspondences are related to um, T1 spectrification. Um, oh, sorry, uh, this, I forgot to actually take the collimit here. Take the collimit as n goes to infinity on that side. Um, right, so if instead of the Nisnevichification here, you put this uh, full motivic localization, and this precisely compute the mapping space in the category of P1 spectra, more or less by definition. And uh, yeah, so you see that the mapping spaces in P1 spectra and frame correspondences are closely related to this uh, Boivoski lemma. And I mean, this is the, the basic idea in the proof of reconstruction, but uh, I mean, it's still actually a lot more work. I mean, there's, there's a lot of, you know, further things to do, so. But uh, yeah, okay, so I think, um, oh, actually, sorry, let me just take one more second. I want to also give a reference. Um, for more details on the proof of this reconstruction theorem, there's some lecture notes by Tom Bachman and Elden Elemento. Uh, I think from uh, the end of last year, so it's like lecture, no lecture notes on motivic infinite loop spaces or something like this, where they explained from uh, in this in the language of frame correspondences that I'm using here, they explain how this proof of how this proof of the reconstruction theorem. All right, so I'll stop here. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, that was very good. Um, so, applause for Mark. Thank you. So, do we have any questions for Mark? Oh, at least I have one, if no one else uh, wants to ask. So, I have a sort of a naive question, perhaps. Uh, but uh, okay, so putting all this stuff together and then considering what it implies to say Morel, uh, Le Levin Morel, algebraic cobordism, it seems to me that if you have a degree D et al morphism between smooth uh, K varieties, then the push forward of the fundamental class goes to D times the fundamental class. Uh, and okay, the reason for this is clear if they are affine, but is there a simple reason for this if they are not affine? Um, so you mean the fundamental class in algebraic cobordism? Yes. Um, Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, I, I don't know how to answer this. It's not even clear to me why it's true in the affine case, actually. But. Well, in that case, I think it's a global complete intersection, and then there's an easy argument. Ah, OK. Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Thanks, anyway. OK, any other questions? 
maybe I have a uh, maybe I have a uh, this one pain. Maybe uh, I have a comment uh, concerning the part two uh, of the theorem. There was a theorem, main theorem, uh, part one, uh, two, and three. Uh, and I would like to make a comment comment concerning uh, part two. Uh, no, uh, concerning part three. So I would say that uh, Vyvodsky in his theorem uh, uh, uses uh, correspondences uh, given by devices of de devices of uh, of rational functions, and uh, in the frame analog of part three, this doesn't uh, work at all, uh, and this means that one should try to avoid this, and to avoid this, one should uh, in fact replace te technique. Uh, in such a way uh, that uh, which allows us to use only regular devices of regular functions. And this is uh, really a big, big difference between uh, Vyvodsky, uh, 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 Vyvodsky uh, theorem 3 uh, and uh, this theorem 3, which is uh, written on the screen. Mm -hmm. Wait, this, is, this is the comment. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the precision. Uh, yeah, fine. Well, yeah, I, mean, I didn't mean to imply that, you know, is it trivial to go through Vygotsky's work and just, you know. But, uh, yeah, it is. Uh, yes, if it is, uh, I could give just, uh, I could give just some um, uh, uh, simple type of uh, uh, statement uh, for the part three. I mean, to, part, to put, uh, but three, particularly, you need to take to pull the following statement: uh, take an open, uh, uh, an open, the risky open uh, subset uh, of a fine line, uh, and uh, take uh, the restriction from uh, f of uh, this u to f of generic point. Uh, in Vygotsky uh, proof. I mean, I would say that you cannot mimic uh, the Vyvodsky proof uh, to get this, uh, this injectivity uh, in the frame context. The technique is, uh, is very much different. Uh, even for this uh, kind of very first question. Okay, this was just a comment. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks for the comments. Okay, anybody else want to? I have a kind of a stupid question here. Um, the, uh, the category uh, of, uh, of motives can be thought of in, inside of the category of the spectra as the, as the, um, uh, the, the modules over the sphere the spectrum. And if you sort of translate that into your cor frame correspondence language, what, do you get a theorem there? Um, I mean, I guess, so because, oops, because of this reconstruction theorem, I mean, frame matrix spectra are just modules of the sphere spectrum. Yeah? So I mean, the analog of, so, I mean, frame, frame correspondences are to the sphere spectrum, like Wojewski, so Wojewski's correspondence. Ellenberg McLean spectrum. Okay. Um. Okay. Um, well, uh, one last chance for a final question, and then I think we'll wrap it up. Well, I can ask another question about cobordism. <laughs> uh, so, okay, so you, you have this uh, nice presentation for algebraic cobordism in, in your theory. And then if you evaluate it on, on a field, then you don't even have to take uh, Zariski localization, uh, if I understood correctly. 
So can you then compute or give some sort of a geometric characterization or easy characterization for some higher cobordism groups? Like for instance, uh, high, first higher K theory of a field is just a multiplicative group. Do you have some some kind of simple description for cobordism? Higher cobordism? Um, I mean, kind of, but it's, I mean, if, if, if the if block cycle complex uh, is, is ex counts as something explicit uh, for you, then you have a similar thing, right? Um, I mean, you have this kind of um, presentation as a as this simplicial space, um, but uh, I mean, there is a restriction in the, the range of the of the cobordism because oh, okay, so I mean, I'll say more about this next time that you know we can we can kind of describe the underlying space of the positive suspension of the algebraic cobordism spectrum as well. So this gives you the uh, algebraic cobordism groups in negative uh, uh, negative weight. Yes. So we don't really, we so our 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 results don't say anything about uh, positive. Uh, algebraic cobordism groups. Uh, by positive and negative, you mean? Uh, I'm always confused. I mean, the uh, uh, so by negative, I mean um, positive uh, co-dimension. Or, or, so negative dimension. Yeah, so I mean, for, so for a field, there is nothing uh, in negative degrees. So, uh, OK, that's unfortunate. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. It is. I mean, any degree zero, of course, is just like Z, so it's not too interesting. Uh, although, I mean, I guess you do have a presentation for the, uh, the, the higher homotopy groups of this, I mean, degree zero part for a field, which just comes from this simplicial space. So I, mean, I guess you have a, yeah, some biosphere count vector sequence and, and but I mean, it's not clear that, I mean, you, you won't be able to make some very explicit computations in this. Okay. But, I mean, I, I'll say more things about algebraic cobordism next time. Maybe this will answer some of these questions. Okay, so then uh, I believe we're, Gonna wrap it up then. So thanks, Mark. Uh, we'll have part three on Monday at the same time, hopefully the same link. And uh, the today's lecture should be on YouTube in a few hours, I suspect. So I'll stop the recording here. And if you want to hang out, you can hang out for a bit longer. <laughs>